Thank you so much. A very good evening, everyone. So by a show of hands, can I know how many of you here are actually aware of Parkinson's? A good few. Parkinson's is the second most prevalent neurodegenerative disorder affecting about 10 million people across the world. The patients, they suffer from severe movement and coordination problems, and all this because the population of neurons in their brain is dying out. Now, the current treatment strategies that exist address just the symptoms and not the cause of the problem. What we need here is a therapeutic option which would cater to the cause of disease. Well, the most viable therapeutic option available are the neurotrophic factors. What are these neurotrophic factors? These are the proteins which are responsible for enhancing the survival and reducing or reversing any kind of damage which is caused to the neurons. Seems like the answer is right there. Why not just go for it? Because they have a very short half-life. That means when you provide them into the patients, they're gone, just like that. To this end, my research focuses at development of these biomaterial pills which would safely carry the neurotrophic factors and put them into the brain and deliver them in a controlled manner. Now, the biomaterial that I am using is fibrin. Why fibrin, you might ask? Because, firstly, taken from your own system, it kind of reduces the risks associated with immune responses, and secondly, we can very easily manipulate fibrin to form a tunable system for control release. That's what we precisely did. We followed this template method to form these little fibrin cages, put the neurotrophic factors into these cages, and use them for delivery in the brain. I'm sure you must be very curious, what am I doing with this? Let me give you a sneak peek into my project. So what I have done till date is to fabricate these pills, and we have tested them for their stability as well as for their impact on neurons. They seem to keep the neurons very happy. With this, we moved to the second stage of the project where we tested these pills into the animal model. And this was the very first time that any of these natural biomaterial systems were actually tested on an animal model in this context. What do we know? The results were fantastic. We could actually obtain a very sustained release over a definite period of time. And that's precisely what we wanted. This was sufficient motivation to move to the final stage of the project where we want to combine the fibrin pills with neurons, put them together in a gel system and give them to a Parkinson's model to see if they can replace the dead neurons and re-establish the neuronal network, thereby functionally reversing Parkinson's. So that's where we are heading to. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks. Very interesting stuff. Um, my first question is, uh, you're working with mice models. Um, do, do, Parkinson's get, uh, do, do mice get Parkinson's? No, actually, we are working with the rat models, and these models are suitably altered to get Parkinson's. So we have different ways to induce Parkinson's in these animal models, and that's what we do when we test all these uh, therapeutic options on them. Um, the brain is sort of an isolated part of our body, isn't it? I I is it a difficult place to deliver drugs to? It is. It is for sure very difficult, and that's one of the limitations when we directly want to use these neurotrophic factors. They can't get through the blood-brain barrier which we have. So when we try to put them in these microspheres and then they are injected into the brain, it's pretty easier to get them through. What's the most uh, difficult part of the research? Is it that delivery mechanism, uh, the fibrin you're talking about, and, and getting the, the treatment in the fibrin, or is it uh, creating the, the factor itself? It's a whole seed that we are talking about here, so uh, the, compli the complex part of it would be actually to get the cells and the material interplay. So we need to coordinate the com communication which we have between the cells and the material for it to work properly. So we need to modify the material suitably that it can, it can help the cells survive the environment inside the body. So that's the complex part of the research here. Do we have any questions from uh, our judges? Okay, give Juhi a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, our next speaker is Mihail Arkin. He's a PhD student at the Insight Center for Data Analytics in NUI Galway. He's working in the Unit for Natural Language Processing. Uh, and despite being from Slovenia, uh, he's finished German studies. He's working at the translation of Irish to English and English to Irish. Uh, please give him uh, a round of applause. 
Thank you, Jonathan. Um, nowadays, we are living in a multilingual world. We can actually access information in many different languages, even if we don't understand the language. Therefore, we can actually use tools or services, for example, machine translation, where we can automatically translate information or text in a document into a language that, that we are familiar with and to get an idea what the text is talking about. But if you were using machine translation already, you probably observed that machine translation not always provide a, a, a accurate translations. So my work is focusing on how to improve the quality of automatically generated translations, which actually can enable us to have a broader access to information across the world. And also, it also trying to improve the translation so we can actually minimize the effort to uh, correct the translation itself. One of the major issues in machine translation is the ambiguity in the language. That means uh, the same word can have different meanings based on the context it appears. And if you don't take care about the meaning of an ambiguous word, the machine translation system will probably translate the word wrongly into the target language. As an example here, we have a text from the Dublin airport where the English text was automatically translated into Irish and it was not really corrected after it. Uh, the mistake was, it is already corrected now, but the mistake was that the word patient, an ambiguous word, was wrongly translated into Irish into the meaning as a person who needs medical care. <laughs> which might be correct in some, uh, in, in some context, but not in the arena context uh, here uh, on the airport. Uh, since I'm starting here in Ireland on the West Coast, uh, we wanted to show the research community our ongoing work on Irish language, which is actually uh, on the resource language in terms of language technologies. We built an SMT system which translates English text into uh, Irish and vice versa. We collected uh, publicly available data sets, that means parallel uh, corpora, uh, and with uh, careful data selection, we could learn the association between words in English and Irish language. Uh, compared then the results to, let's say, to the widely used machine translation service, which everybody is using nowadays, uh, and which was also used uh, in the Dublin airport, we could improve the quality of the translations. Specifically also in this case, uh, as a sample here, our system, which we called uh, IRIS, uh, uh, correctly translated the word patient into Irish, into the meaning of to stay calm. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. at that very moment in time. So you have a conversation with someone in a different language, you don't need to speak their language. My question is, um, w w you know, we're, we're in the west of Ireland, um, uh, the Irish language is very precious to us. Will this mean that we won't have to learn Irish anymore? Will anyone bother <laughs> learning another language if computers are going to translate them for us? I don't think so. I think you learn a language because you, you love the language, because you actually you need the challenge you know, to learn another language. So I don't think that you know, machine translation would really replace uh, to learn any uh, language as well. It, is a really it will be a huge help to gather information, to make analytics in different languages without having, let's say, uh, really uh, translators in between. But uh, people learn language because they love it or they, they, they like to know the culture of the language because also the language actually transports the culture of nation, let's say, uh, to the, the person who learns it. So I don't <laughs> think so. My, my second question is, uh, you're a Slovenian, uh, you studied German studies, why Irish to English? Why not German to Slovenian? Why, why make it so hard for yourself? Uh, specifically because f here on the West Coast, you know, we are very close to the Galtacht and uh, we, we saw actually that there is a need to push even the language technologies for the Irish language more. We wanted to make it visible that let's say also on the West Coast we are doing uh, uh, research on it, so not always uh, the Dublin, got, Dublin gets all the benefit of it. Mm. Uh, and it was a very nice challenge to do it. So your claim is that you are tr translating these texts better than, uh, you say this, you're talking about Google Translate, yeah, yeah. right? We are talking about it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bold claim. We, we did evaluation, not only on this sentence, but maybe on, uh, on a huge data set, maybe of thousand sentences. And based comparing their system and our system, we got better results. Man, I wish I had that for my leaving cert. <laughs> <laughs> Mihail, thank you very much. Round of applause. Thank you.
Our next speaker is Mimi Zhao. She received her PhD in economics uh, from Sussex in 2015. Uh, her thesis is focusing on uh, the effects of health on migration, um, and she is uh, going to be joining us. She's from the group of Health Economics and Poli Policy Analysis in NUI Galway, which she joined in July 2015. Please give Mimi a round of applause. Thank you very much. And today I'm going to talk about the correlation between parents' BMI, um, obesity and the children's B obesity. So as we say in the picture, in the past decades, the, there has been a growing rate of obesity across countries, either in developing countries or developed countries. And, uh, and this phenomena has been observed in both generations. We can see that Wei Luni is quite fit but uh, we don't know whether he will be like his father in the future. So, <laughs> and obesity, as we all know, is a result of both environment and the genetic factors. In this study, I'm looking at the correlation between parents' BMI and obesity and the children's obesity. And uh, this correlation is a combination of both family environment factors and the genetic factors. So, Next step, I will use a graph to show you what the correlation is like and how the correlation varies among skinny kids and obese kids. So in this graph, the horizontal axis shows the, um, this is the child's BMI, obesity, and the vertical um, axis indicates the parents' um, BMI. Um, obesity. So the key thing here is that the slope is quite constant and nearly parallel across these countries. And the last step, I'm going to break down this correlation among the distribution of children's BMI to see how this varies among skinny kids and the obese kids. So this is the skinny kids and this is the obese kids. So what we can see here is the same pattern comes again and again this correlation seems tend to be greater for the obese kids. And, uh, but you might think obese kids in Indonesia may not seem, may not seem to be seen as obese in the States. So the next step, I put all the kids together and put them in one picture. So this is what it looks like. And uh, what's new here is that um, it seems for the skinny kids, the correlation kind of converge to the same level. Country doesn't make a big difference, but for the obese kids, country seems does matter. So the key finding of this study is that there's a strong correlation between parents' obesity and the children's obesity, and especially stronger for the obese children. And uh, so what we learn from this study, I think one of the implications is that Anything we do to reduce obesity in the current generation not only helps ourselves, but it also helps our children and the children's children. Thank you. Mimi, why study uh, obesity? It, it seems like a subject that is being studied by so many people. Yes. Why does it interest you? I think uh, it's... Do you care about your body weight? <laughs> I think everyone cares about age, right? And especially for girls, we all always look at, do I look fat? So we care about this. So this is very important. And I think it's fascinating. It's intriguing, like me, to, to study the mechanism, especially the intergenerational mechanism behind this. Why some people look fat, no matter how much they eat, how much they drink, they still, like, uh, they can't, just can't reduce it. Like, so why some people, they eat a lot of still like, uh, seems like they are lucky people, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> Evie Nihulavon, who's my co-presenter on the Science Squad, she, her diet is terrible, and she, still, she always looks amazing, and, she, uh, and you know, it doesn't seem like she can never put on weight. Yes. But, she, she, uh, but her diet is way worse than mine, and I'm always, I think this season, we've got a new series, coming, and I, I looked at some of that, we were doing voiceover in the booth yesterday, and I was looking at myself, I was going, oh God. <laughs> That's not good. I was so like, what can you do with this? It's like, we I don't have a budget for CGI, Jonathan. Uh, Mimi, um, is there uh, the correlation that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. 
But what's the cause of it? Is there an epigenetic factor? Is there a, if my grandmother um, eats a lot, is, is the likelihood that there is a genetic change that will affect me? Is, is that why? Do we know about the relation of epigenetics and, and obesity? Um, I think uh, one of the biggest questions in these studies is the genetic versions environment factors, so-called literature nature. So I think a lot of studies are doing this, but people haven't reached a consensus. But one of the basic conclusions from this is that genetics seems to matter more than environment factors. So uh, in the States, they, use the, they, do, they are doing experiments using the rats, and, uh, and the, they also a lot of data, and they come up with genetic makeup, this kind of data. I'm trying to do that. To, this is what I'm going to do in the last step, yes. Okay, yeah. Um, so, so we can essentially blame our parents for putting on the pounds. <laughs> um, uh, Mimi, thank you very much. Thank Give you, a round of applause, thank you very much. Yeah. Look, I, t I talked um, at the beginning about the diversity. And by the way, thank you all for coming. What a huge crowd. What a great crowd to come out here on a Thursday night to uh, this beautiful theatre. But um, uh, I was talking a little bit about the diversity of the topics we're hearing tonight, and I think this is a perfect example of it. Um, and we're not going to hear from Claudia. Um, Claudia's research into Irish noggins is a part of new material she rediscovered to revise her book, Irish Country Furniture, from 1700 to 1950. Uh, this is a, an, a subject I'm very much looking forward to hearing about. And uh, we'll now hear about the noggin and uh, some history of uh, furniture from Claudia. Thank you very much. Give her a round of applause. Thank you. Good evening. This evening I'm going to talk about noggins. Um, and here we have a couple of noggins. Basically a noggin is a small wooden vessel made like a barrel. And here we can see it in a watercolour, a detail of a watercolour actually from Galway from 1844, being used as the centrepiece for the traditional Irish meal in poor houses. So the potatoes were boiled, they were strained into a flat round basket. The basket was placed on the cooking pot and the noggin of buttermilk, which you can see in the middle, was used to dip, in, dip each potato into as you ate. Um, noggins were used not just for, for liquid, but also for food. So they had to be watertight, and they varied slightly in construction according to who made them. Um, the cooper was the main person who made the heavy, sturdy noggins, which have got metal hoops like the one you can see there. The word noggin and the dictionary definition tells us that it's a measure for liquid. Um, you've probably all heard of a noggin, which is a small whiskey bottle of 200 millilitres. There is definitely a connection. If you look very, very closely at these objects, I've I mentioned the Cooper's metal hoot noggins. There's a noggin weaver who was a specialist who made his noggins with a very intricate, special secret joint. He wrapped his piece of ash around the staves um, and you can just see that detail there. When you look closely at the upstanding handle or stave, which is wider at the top, um, there's a slant on the top of it, and that was done so that it could be washed and turned upside down to drain um, and then left on display. And you can see that in the background of a tiny wood engraving here from 1825 of an Irish interior um, with a dresser in the background. So there's all sorts of little intricacies. Understanding exactly how they were made is very helpful, particularly for museum curators who need to be able to conserve them, and also for the increasingly popular um, forest skill courses and green woodworking courses that will need to be able to reproduce them in the future. Here's um, finally a detail from an enormous oil painting of a fair at Glendalough in Wicklow in 1813 by Joseph Peacock. This is a very small detail of a huge painting and it's the bottom right-hand corner. You can just see the cooper here with all his domestic vessels all spread out around him. And that little blue arrow shows you a basket of noggins for sale. So it's interesting to imagine them being sold and very much in demand at such a fair for eating and for drinking. I brought a noggin with me this evening, and I normally would love to show it around and let you handle it. But it's ironic that an object that was once so extraordinarily widespread and would have been in almost every house in Ireland, except for the very most destitute, has now become so rare that I can not only not pass it around, but there's only less than a couple of dozen of them left in Irish museums. Thank you.
I don't think so. In fact, when you look up the word noggin in dictionaries, there's about five or six different definitions, and that's just one of them. You know, the unit, the, the measure of liquid and the wooden vessel definitions are interrelated along with nagging, you know, which is our modern version. There is. Actually, this one can define this little object as one of the most intrinsically complex. It's made of about 13 pieces of wood, um, and yet it has to hold water. You know, so the noggin weaver, who was derided for his lack of ambition because he only made noggins and nothing else, had to make something that wouldn't leak, that would be robust, that could compete with the coopers and all the other types of noggins that were being made, um, would be examined and would be hurled about. And yet, could be something really lovely as a wedding present. Or yes, I would suggest it's just as complex as silversmithing or goldsmithing. Yes. So this is a blood pressure monitor, a really simple device that's found in houses all across the country. But imagine, instead of using a simple device like this, that every time you had your blood pressure monitored, you had to go to the hospital. Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But given that five patients were diagnosed with breast cancer today, two of whom will die from the disease, that is exactly the state of breast cancer screening. So microwave imaging is a promising alternative that can make breast cancer uh, screening as simple as blood pressure monitoring. So my devices such as those developed at NUIG shown here on screen are low cost, costing almost 10 times less than the equivalent X-ray mammography system. So they can be used in GP surgeries and local clinics all across the country. They also use low power microwaves which means um, instead of using the more harmful x-rays, which means that patients can be screened more often and at younger ages. So how does it work? An antenna transmits a microwave pulse into the breast, which is reflected from any tumors, and recorded at other antennas scattered around the breast. Beamforming algorithms are then used to focus these reflections to create an image of the interior of the breast. And a key element of these beamforming algorithms is the speed of a microwave pulse. But all patients are different, and the composition of all patients' breasts are different, consisting of layers of skin, fat, other tissues, as well as potentially tumours. And microwaves travel at different speeds in all of these different layers. So my work looks at ways to estimate the speed of a microwave for each individual patient, uh, so you can create a clearer and more focused image. So in particular, my method is similar to that used in a digital camera. A digital camera automatically selects the best settings to use so that all the key features of an image are clearly identifiable and in focus. My method automatically chooses the best speed to use so that all potential tumors are clearly identifiable to the doctor looking at the scan. Um, the early studies have shown that um, the image is at its most focused and most clearest when the best speed is used, which indicates that focal quality metrics, which are common in autofocus applications today, can be used to predict the best speed to use. This technique is used worldwide. Universities in Canada, in the US, and in the UK are all looking at similar problems as well as in industry, so equipment manufacturers Agilent are developing custom hardware for this application. And with such custom hardware and algorithms as I've described here, microwave imaging can deliver on its promise of making breast cancer screening as simple as blood pressure monitoring. Thank you.
Microwaves aren't new at all, no. So they're used in radar systems, in airports, and in body scanners in the airport, and even to heat food. So the, the novelty here is that they're used to look inside the body for the first time. But they're much lower power than you would find in a, in a microwave that heats your food, which is why they're much safer than X-ray mammography. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so it started maybe 10 or 15 years ago that people have been working on this. Um, and this is, they're now coming to fruition, so there's already groups, say in Canada, that have done patient trials. Our prototype that I've shown here earlier on will probably be in patient trials in a year or two. So it's progressing fairly fast. Good. Um, and uh, what's the biggest challenge to, to, to your research? I mean, it sounds like the holy grail for, you know, regular um, breast checking for cancer. Why, what are the biggest problems with your sort of research, considering you're working with some with technology that has been around for a while? So the, the complexities are, the, are in the algorithms. So in a, in a screening scenario, you don't know what the patient's breast is going to be like, obviously, or you wouldn't be screening them. So things like uh, calculating the speed for each individual patient and removing reflections from the skin are all the challenges. So that's why we work on the algorithm side as, as well as the hardware. And with improvements in hardware, that's becoming more possible. So one of, one of the arguments against um, more regular pap smears, for example, or cervical uh, smears, one of the arguments against this is that uh, more false negatives uh, will occur if people are getting tested all the time, they'll be going to the doctors, the, the, the hospitals won't be able to cope. Uh, have, have you thought about that side of it, that if people are getting checks all the time and it's early detection that actually it may have more harm and put more stress on the, the breast cancer um, treatment services that we have in this country? So that is a problem currently with uh, X-ray mammography, that it refers an awful lot of people for unnecessary biopsies and ultrasounds and MRIs, which not only causes trouble for the patient psychologically, but it's also it is an expense in the healthcare system as well. So that is something that microwave imaging can address, is have lower rates of false positive detection. Okay. Mm -hmm. Round of applause for Declan, please. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aoife Murray. She works as a library assistant in St. Angela's College, who, as I said, are, are taking part in this competition for the first time, so looking for a big a warm round of applause for her. Um, the research that she's talking about was completed as part of her MSc Information Library Studies with Aberystwyth University in Wales. Uh, please give her a round of applause. Aoife Murphy. Hello, good evening. The research I am presenting on this evening looked at the, or looks at the library needs of the international nursing students at St. Angela's College in Sligo, alongside the expectations of the nursing faculty for their library use. Um, the aim of the research was to develop recommendations for how the library can bridge services that would bridge, er, would develop services that would bridge any gaps that were identified uh, between the, 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 the expectation and the actual reality. Uh, using student, interview or student questionnaires and then interviews with both faculty and students, the research discovered that both parties felt that the students were very unprepared to conduct research and to use library, use, fully utilise the library services when they arrived on campus. Uh, the students felt that while their expectations of their faculty were incredibly clear to them, the actual achievement of reaching the summit of that mountain of expectation was very difficult due to their lack of previous academic library experience and their lack of online research experience in their previous studies. Faculty agreed with these factors but also felt it was more complex looking at things like language, uh, professional culture and other issues like that. Um, as they began their journey, they felt they had a mountain to climb. However, they felt very supported by both faculty and library. The students felt supported as they continued on their climb. For example, only 8% of the students felt that their language was a barrier to their academic communication, but 100% of faculty that were interviewed felt that it was an issue. And the reason for this was that faculty had identified the differing la linguistic and research abilities of their students, as well as the different expectations of their teaching and learning relationship, and had adapted their methodologies to ensure that their curriculum objectives were met. Uh, the students then continued on their journey feeling supported in that way and so as a result they didn't feel so uh, intimidated by the prospect of scaling the mountain. 
um, as they continued on their journey, we looked at how are they actually meeting their expectations. And so the faculty are adapting the, their uh, methodologies, but they still have an expectation of how students need to use the library. And so we look at students being very aware of what was expected of them. However, as they went to the top of their, or as they achieved the expectation, we realized that um, they're not utilizing library services fully due to a reluctance to ask for help and a reluctance to um, engage fully with services. And so we decided to look at a program of information literacy, which will incorporate user education, will incorporate things like one-to-one um, -one library instruction and a rising scale, so that student, a rising scale of education, so that students can then develop the skills required to not only achieve their Bachelor of Nursing qualification, but skills that will make them effective practitioners in an evidence-based practice field, such as uh, which nursing is. And so this program is under development at the moment, and we hope that it will learn or develop students into becoming lifelong learners. Thank you. So, good God, it was, what, 20 years ago that I was in uh, university. Have um, libraries changed a lot in, in, in that time? Absolutely. It's, it's 20 years since I did my undergraduate, and things have changed significantly. One of the biggest differences would be, obviously, that a lot of information is available online now. So when I, when I was in, in college, everything was textbook-based. Uh, there were some journals, but now journals are freely available through research databases, and particularly for something like nursing. The expectation is that their assignments are evidence-based. Um, therefore, they're searching for research that will back up the theory. Um, so, yeah, libraries have changed significantly. Why, um, why do people need to go to the library anymore? Um, you know, we look at the amount of information that's available online. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's the benefit of going to a library rather than, as you say, pouring through you know, the wealth of medical journals that are available mm -hmm. publishing the latest research? Well, the, the, obviously there is still a lot of, it's particularly for undergraduates, uh, a lot of the work they do is textbook based and not all of those are available online. Uh, the library provides a, a community and certainly in, the, in our college it provides like a community hub for students to come and interact with each other, with the expertise of library staff. And also not all students are, you know, have access to uh, broadband, particularly in Sligo in some areas, mm. or remotely, or, um, you know, if they live off campus, they don't always have that access uh, that they can get in the library. So uh, looking at this research, looking at, you know, um, those studying nursing, particularly with language difficulties, what sort of innovations came out of your, your, uh, 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 your research? Well, what we discovered was that the students are, they're reluctant to engage with library staff. Um, and we found that, organically a leader developed from this group and that person sought out services from library staff and so one of the ideas is that we will identify a leader in the group. It's quite a small group and that's one of the advantages for us is that we can engage on that one-to-one -one basis to encourage them to overcome their cultural maybe reluctances uh, to, to seek help and make them aware of what, what we have in the library. Well we always need more nurses. Aoife, thank you very much. Round of applause for Aoife, please. Uh, our next speaker is a thir third year uh, PhD student um, from Kuram, the Center for uh, Research in Medical Devices, originally from Northern Malaysia. Uh, Isma Liz Liza Maud Isa uh, worked for the Ministry for Health and then she moved to uh, Galway in 2013. Uh, Isma, Isma is focusing her research on the development of material implant to relieve back pain. Give her a round of applause, please. Isma. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Before I start my presentation, I would like to know how many people in this room have experienced or suffered back pain? Wow, this is the big number. Thank you for your response. Well, this is what I'm interested in finding a solution for low back pain using a biomaterial implant. And predominantly, 60 to 80 percent of the world population have suffered low back pain in their lifetime, and the damage of intervertebrates become the most contributor to this problem. 
So what is intervertebral protease? It is a pad of cartilage that lie between the adjacents of our spinal bone and it has been shown that the increasing of inflammations and neuronal growth factor can cause the disc to collapse and increase the sensory nerve activity which is the nerve that carry the pain information in the body and leading to back pain. Therefore, the purpose of my research is to develop a smart biomaterial implant and investigate whether using this material can reduce inflammations and pain due to damage of the disc. With that, here in my research, I'm using hyaluronic acid hydrogel, as you can see in the picture. It is a type of synthetic biomaterial that I'm testing in the cells and animal before it can go further in humans. Ladies and gentlemen, how do I perform the cell experiment? Is by taking out the cell from the cow tail, growth them, and checking inflammatory markers and neuronal growth factor after giving biomaterial treatment to the cells. Secondly, I implant this material in the rat tail after induced injury and further checking the sensory nerve activity into this. So far, the results are very impressive, where this biomaterial has shown therapeutic effect by reducing the inflammations and neuronal growth factor in the disc. Also, not surprisingly, it reduced the sensory nerve activity in order to relieve the pain. So that at the moment in my final study, I'm looking how this material can affect the pattern of the pain behavior in the animal experiment so that I can determine the effectiveness of this biomaterial in the pain model due to damage of the disc. With that, to end my presentation, I'd like to conclude the ultimate goal of my research is actually to develop an implantable device that can be used as a disc replacement in the clinic so that in 20 years' time, low back pain due to damage of the disc will be no longer an issue. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Isma. I, I, was, um, I was surprised to see so many of you sort of going. <laughs> it's funny to ask people who have got back pain, kind of, you know, to move. <laughs> ah, yes, me. Um, so, what does this implant look like? Uh, it just, just looks like a jelly light. Have you been eating the jelly bean? What is yeah, it like people just today? like a jelly bean. <laughs> yes, I've been eating some jelly beans, as well as some other things. And so it looks like so it's a hydrogel. This is a hydrogel, it's jelly-like structure. So we, what we're doing now is trying to mimic the nature of the native tissue of our disc. So it's just like a jelly structure. So, so I'm, I suppose I'm confused by the, the, the word implant, because when I think implant, I think, you know, cyborg sort of stuff. This is, this is not electronic, although there are electronic cur currents in, in our spine. It's, not, it, it's nothing to do with elec uh, electricity. It's, it's to do no, with... No, we don't the uh, integrate them with the electricity. But the beauty of this hydrogel, which is this implant, they have the therapeutic, as I mentioned in my presentation. So that's why we don't need other resources. To, I mean, to do the healing of the, our spines. So they have the beauty of these healing properties. They just reduce inflammation and pain, perhaps uh, where I'm going to do for my final stage of my experiment in the pain model. What's the biggest challenge to, to your final stage? Okay, the biggest challenge is we want to get the ethical approval because for my study, the pain model, this is the first study in the world, you mean? Can you imagine, this is the first study for the pain due to damage of the disc. So I need to pay, pre pre prepare more of the documentation. I need to justify why I need this model. So I need to induce the pain in the animal that might be unethical. So for my study, it's very ethical because I need that model in order to look at the, <laughs> to look at the effectiveness of this biomaterial implant. No, I see, yeah. I, I see your logic, but I also understand why, why the audience kind of... Look, it's ethical for me because I need it. Uh, <laughs> which, which, if ethics was done that way, I, I think we, we go back to the 60s and 70s where God knows what they did uh, in the name of science. Uh, but actually, I, I really enjoy that. Thank you so much for joining us. Please uh, give Isma a round of applause. Isma. 
Uh, so our next speaker um, is Daniel Norton. Um, he used to work as a civil and environmental, uh, environmental engineer in the area of planning and wastewater treatment. Um, thanks to the recession, he got the opportunity to return to study. <laughs> thanks, recession. Uh, and so uh, he's now looking at um, biodiversity, clean water, and putting a price on something that we don't normally value, at least not in an economic sense. Uh, please give Daniel a round of applause. So every day decisions are made about the environment by individuals, companies, the government, civil servants, property owners. And anything that affects the environment can have an impact on us. We have to improve the decision making by making the values that we use more explicit, therefore improving transparency in our decision making related to the environment. To show an example of this, I'm taking this back in history to the late 1980s, early 1990s. This is Crow Patrick. It's a mountain just near Westport, overlooking Clue Bay and Mayo. Probably a lot of you might know of it. So in that period, uh, a gold company came along and thought, found gold in the mountain and thought this was a good idea. It was estimated it was worth in the region of 30 million pounds at a time, which is around 100 billion euro now. So for the company, they looked at the market price of the gold, and then they looked at the market prices of what goods were on the mountain. At the time, it was cheap, probably. Was there 30 euro... 30 million pounds worth of sheep on the mountain, I'm not sure. But what it meant is that the locals weren't happy. And why were they not happy? Because the market prices didn't take into other values that the local people had. You can see here by the headlines, they weren't too happy about it. They were kicking up a fuss. So these other values that didn't count are these non-market goods and services. Where the environment provides them, they're called ecosystem services. These are benefits that humans derive from nature. In the case of the Crow Patrick, the main one was the spiritual values. It's a holy mountain. People climb it every year. Some of them in their bare feet. We also have recreation values. Up until recently, it was thought roughly about 60 to 80,000 people climbed it every year. But now, recent counts have shown it's nearly 200,000 people. Also, the aesthetic value. If you go to Westport, you might have to pay extra for your hotel room to get a nice view of Crow Patrick, or pay extra for if you have your house that has a nice view of it. The carbon sequestering, there's blanket bogs on the mountain, and these provide, these take up carbon very slowly, but if they're exploited, they can also let carbon into the air, and this mitigate, or this is damaging the cl climate change, or contributing to climate change change. There's also biodiversity in the mountain, it's a proposed national heritage region. So in our project, we're looking at a similar issue in our seas and oceans around Ireland. When we talk about blue ecosystem services, or blue ecosystems, these are the, our seas and oceans. They're also our beaches and estuaries or salt marshes and mud flats. So we look at a framework called CISIS, the Common International Classification of Ecosystem Services, to identify, quantify, value, and where possible, map these different ecosystem services. Some of them spring to mind like provisioning services. These are fish and aquaculture. You buy them in the shop to have a market price. But many others, such as the regulating services, don't have a price. Many of you went to toilets this morning. There's a value to that in you. You had to go somewhere, but you didn't pay for it. Well, maybe you do now, but if you live in the country, you didn't pay for it. So some of it goes into the sea. Another thing is carbon sequestering. The ecosystems take up carbon. That's another mitigating climate change. You can see here we have cultural services like Galway hookers or recreation. Here I am in the ocean in one of our blue fag beaches around Ireland. And there's a value to go on that as well. We might put an actual price on it, but we have to take it into account when we make decisions about the environment. And that's part of improving transparency in decision-making related to the environment. Thanks very much. I'm reminded of, um, I don't know if it's a text or a film, this, this quote of, you know, you can't put a price on uh, a, a sea view. Um, you can't put a price on, uh, you know, the wind in the trees, but you actually are trying to put a price on these things. Like, how do you value something like the view from Quote Patrick? How, how do you put a monetary price on that? Or something as, as impossible to measure as, as carbon sequestration? So let's take the first one first, the aesthetic view. So like that, if you go to the hotel, you're paying an extra price. So the, the market will play into a pint. Another thing we can do is what's called hedonic modeling, where we can measure houses that have the view and see if overall they have a value uh, more than a house that doesn't have a view. So there's a study in, done by the RSI, and they showed that people who lived 250, uh, 0 to 250 metres to the sea had an extra, I think it was 15% value onto their house okay. because of that sea view. In terms of climate change, there's loads of carbon markets out there now. There's loads of, there's a carbon tax in this country. You're paying, I think, 20, 20 euro 
per ton of carbon. So we can estimate from the science that other people are doing and take that uh, into account and how many tons of carbon are being taken in by these ecosystems in the sea and then we can apply that either price, either the market price, which I think is 17 euro per ton, or the, the tax that we have to pay to, you know what I mean? Like, and then hopefully that will mean that we can value these uh, environments that are taking the carbon and protect us from climate change. That's uh, I'm going to ask you a tricky question because it's something that's uh, been particularly on my mind in the past few years, and that is um, considering a lot of the policies in this country are not evidence-based, that we do not have a lot of scientists, for example, uh, making decisions based on research, uh, how optimistic are you that this sort of research will actually inform policy, will actually form part of the decision-making process when it comes to developing in areas of uh, natural beauty, uh, conservation, and so on? I think there's a balance to be had. So at the moment, this research is being funded by the ETA, EPA. And when we sit down with the EPA, we also sit down with the Department of Environment, uh, National Parks and Wildlife Service, and uh, the Marine Institute as well. So they're taking on board what we're doing now. This research is feeding into some sort of policy. But I take your point. But I also take the point of, I can put values on things here now. But that shouldn't be the sole decision tool that we use. You can see it when in the Crow Patrick case, the first value up, up there was a spiritual value. I don't know if we can ever put an economic value on spiritual values because we can weigh up all the gold and everything in the world. But at the end of the day, there has to be a democratic element to making these decisions as well. So this is just a further dimension for making the tools. The same with environmental impact studies, the same with the biodiversity studies. This is only tools that the ultimate decision maker, which is elected by us democratically, can make these decisions. So it's not just this is the only method. It's only a part of the whole process, I think. Powerful words from Dan. I'll give him a round of applause, please. Thanks, Daniel. Cleena Hensi is originally from Mayo. She completed her undergraduate degree in language and cultural studies at uh, UL in 2012. Um, she's particularly interested in represent representations of memory and uh, trauma and how these uh, appear uh, in text and, and, and particularly um, to do with the complex legacies of uh, the Algerian war in France. Uh, really interesting subject. Can't wait to hear what she has to say. Please put your hands together for Kleena. Thank you very much. Now, the central focus of my research is autobiographical writing by daughters of Achis, who were Algerian men who fought as auxiliary soldiers in the French army during the Algerian War, which began in 1954 and ended with Algeria gaining independence in 1962. Now, the Algerian War was very much a taboo subject in France, and the role of the Achis then has been the subject of an even more profound public and official silence. Although the exact figures are contested, between 60,000 and 150,000 Achis were killed during violent reprisals by the Algerian nationalists in the aftermath of the war. Those who succeeded in seeking refuge in France were placed, along with their families, in military-run internment camps on the margins of society, where they were afforded very little freedom, which affected their ability to integrate into society later on. Now moving on to my specific research interest, the daughters of these men. While sons of Achis had led riots and hunger strikes in the camps in the 1970s, which drew attention to the Achis mistreatment and led to the closure of the last of the camps, the voices of daughters of Achis reached the public sphere much later, with the publication of four autobiographical works, each by different authors, in the year 2003. So my own research traces the development of autobiographical writing by daughters of Achis, and I move beyond these four more well-known works to include a forgotten earlier work published 10 years previously in 1993, as well as more recent texts, some self-published, all of which I argue have been overlooked by the relatively small group of scholars working in this area. So my thesis then involves a close reading of these texts, which all challenge the boundaries of autobiography as it has traditionally been defined. For instance, they include a variety of genres such as fiction, poetry, epistolary writing, and traditional folk tales, as well as experimental rhetorical devices such as metaphors, wordplay, and imagined dialogues. So I'm specifically looking at the potential of autobiography in its varied forms to represent a dynamic space which allows these authors to reconstruct and understand their father's experiences and also to come to terms with their own complex identities as daughters of Archies. As the text demonstrated the arduous work involved in confronting and uncovering painful memories which had been repressed by their parents, one of my central arguments is that the first generation's trauma is, paradoxically, transmitted through their silences, which leads these authors to turn to writing as a means of creatively filling in the gaps in their knowledge of their family's experiences. 
I'm using the psychoanalytic concept of working through trauma to establish whether the texts reflect the perceived cathartic role of writing in coming to terms with the unhealed wounds of the past, and I'm examining in particular ways in which the reader is positioned as an addressee and an active witness to their testimonies. So moving beyond the more personal dimension then, I'm hoping to show that this reconstructive memory work plays an important role in transmitting the collective experiences of the Aki community, and ultimately in reinscribing their stories in a more nuanced and complex historical dialogue beyond this idea of them as traitors and collaborators. Thank you very much. Really interesting stuff. It's, it's a subject of, uh, about which I know very little. Um, but one of the questions that, that uh, kind of popped into my head was, uh, how much can we trust self-reported texts? Um, or is that the point? That's a good question. And autobiography studies have developed basically in the 1970s. There was this idea of the autobiographical pact, which was focused a lot on the pact between this author and the reader, very much based on this idea of truth. And you expect the author to tell the truth, you know, to represent a real story. I'm not so much interested in that. I'm actually more interested in the diversity of this autobiographical writing. And I use the term autobiography very lightly. Life writing is more a better term. So I'm more interested in how these daughters reconstruct their family these experiences because they were told very little by their parents who dealt with the stigma and shame attached to the story. So I, yeah, I'm very much looking at the role of fiction and imagination and how this is infused in the texts. Do you think that because of the silence of their parents, they needed to fill it? And, and, and that's why there's that element of creation and fiction that you're actually, that they're actually sort of filling in the gaps that are there that they need to fill in to feel right? Exactly. Uh, on a personal level, that's, that comes across very much in the text, that it's almost a quest that these uh, authors go on, that they need to fill in these gaps, that it, they feel that there's something missing in their family heritage because th their parents stayed silent about their experiences. And as well as that, on a collective level, I think uh, to a certain extent they're using this platform that they have as writers to speak on behalf of the Aki community and fill in these collective gaps as well. Do we see these same sort of writings um, from children uh, from other sorts of, of trauma, say, for example, the, the Holocaust or um, uh, any sort of you know, major genocide? Do, do, we, do we often see creativity in the, the next generation down? Exactly. And uh, the, one of the theories that I'm looking at, the broad uh, range of theories, is trauma theory. And this actually developed out of Holocaust studies, which emerged obviously in the last few decades. So definitely you do see this uh, reconstructive element in uh, writing by uh, children of Holocaust victims or survivors, this need to reconstruct this painful history. And that definitely comes across in other groups. Round of applause for Kina, please. Very interesting stuff. <laughs> Hi, Kina. Four left to go. Um, our next speaker is Hannah Durand. Uh, she's a first year PhD ca candidate in the School of Psychology uh, at NUI Galway. Uh, she has been working in the Centre for Pain Research on the Prime C study uh, and uh, has been awarded the Clinical Pain Research Me uh, Medal at the 2015 Irish Pain Society annual scientific meeting. Uh, she's looking at chronic pain. Give her a round of applause. Hannah Durand. Thank you. Um, so this evening I'm going to talk to you about results from the Prime C study, which was an interdisciplinary effort by the School of Psychology, the discipline of health promotion and the discipline of health economics, uh, to look at the prevalence, impact and economic cost of chronic pain for 5 to 12 year old children living in Ireland. So we know from adult studies and from international um, child studies that pain has wide ranging detrimental effects. Um, people suffering from chronic pain are at increased risk of um, psychiatric disorders. They tend to avail of healthcare services more frequently. Um, it has significant uh, functional impairment in terms of their social development and um, educational attainment. Um, but we have relatively little uh, information about the impact of chronic pain for children in an Irish context. So to address this, we conducted a national school-based survey. Um, so we went all around the country and surveyed 3,000 children and their parents to find out how many of the children living in Ireland were suffering from pain and also how it affected their lives. So we found from our study that 10% of children aged 5 to 12 are suffering from chronic pain. So that's 300 children who have had pain for at least three months in duration. So that's quite a large number. 
Um, we found that relative to children who did not report having chronic pain, these children had significantly impaired quality of life. So they were less able to engage in um, normal developmental activities, such as playing with peers. Uh, they weren't able to attend school or attain the results in school that they were hoping to. And we also found that their day-to-day -day functioning was impaired as a result of pain, particularly for older girls who were more generally anxious. They were more anxious about their pain specifically and were more likely to have depressive symptoms. We also found that of the 300 children who reported chronic pain, only 20% of those children had a parent confirm their report. So that's 80% of children with pain for three months or more whose parents were unaware of the problem. So we also asked the children to tell us about their pain in their own words and how it affected them. So we found that it affected how they were able to function day to day. They couldn't concentrate at school, were often sent home, couldn't engage with their peers in a normal way. Um, they reported a lot of fear. So they were afraid that their pain would get worse, that it wasn't going to go away. They were also afraid to talk about their pain. So a lot of children reported that they were afraid they wouldn't be understood or believed or that they would be brought to the doctor. Some, one little boy reported a fear of needles, so he didn't want to tell his pain in case he got brought to the doctor. They also felt a profound sense of isolation, that nobody understood what they were going through. But on the flip side of that, there was a strong sense of resilience among the children, that they didn't want to let their pain affect their lives, so that they would try to continue on as normal in spite of pain. So that was a, a heartening result that we found. So despite this kind of bleak picture, there is hope out there for the children living with chronic pain in Ireland. So, thank you. <laughs> uh, just a raise of hands, who thought that 10% was a scarily high figure of children 5 to 8? Yeah, I, I, I'm absolutely blown away by that. Mm. And, and I, 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 you know, you were talking about children not being believed, and so um, it's with knowledge of that that I asked the question, when you're talking about 5 to 8 year olds, if their parents are unaware you know, uh, how, uh, how much do you believe these kids actually did have chronic pain? Because the only reason I say it is it seems like such a big figure. Mm. Uh, d can you factor into whether or not people told stories because they, uh, they wanted attention or, or, or were, were lying about their condition for any particular reason? Or would there be any reason why they might? Um, well, we kind of uh, factored in that some children might, you know, exaggerate or mightn't understand that three-month cutoff point for chronic pain. So we anchored it um, depending on the time of the year that we spoke to the children. So if we spoke to them in March, we'd say, oh, have you had a pain every day or most days since Christmas, for example, so that they understood the time frame that we were talking about. Mm. Because obviously a five-year-old isn't going to understand three months quite as concretely as a 12-year-old might. My son um, uses the, the word yesterday interchangeably for any time in the past, <laughs> which is extraordinarily uh, confusing for us. Do you remember we were in Spain yesterday? <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, the, yeah, the problem with time is one thing, but in terms yeah. of attention-seeking, mm. um, or is, is that something that is easy to factor in? Or? If the I mean, how do parents not know that their child has been in pain mm. for, for so long? Well, it depends. I mean, I think... It's a quite a large number, and obviously within that there's a huge number of individual differences. So children are going to have different motivations for reporting or not reporting pain. You know, like I used to be terrible for, oh, I don't want to go to school today, I have a pain. You know, I used to do that all the time. But, you know, different <laughs> children have different... <laughs> and here reasons. you are. I know, I know. It worked out okay in the end. Um, but there are different motivations there, so I don't think that we can say one way or the other that a child doesn't have pain when they report that they do. I mean, the very nature of pain, it's pretty much invisible... Yeah. to an observer. So if a child tells me that they have pain and they understand the time that we're talking about and they're able to explain the impact of that and how they feel it, who are we to say that they don't experience pain? Yeah. Um, so there were children, you know, who, for example, there were children with emotional pain, so children who had suffered from bereavement who um, internalized that and experienced their grief as a physical pain in their chest. So we're not to say that that's not a chronic pain for that child if it's affecting them in that way and that they're having the same impact as someone who's
been in an accident and broken their leg, or someone who's suffering from arthritis, for example. So but the, uh, so this interesting research, um, I interviewed a guy on the program a few uh, months ago that, that showed there's a link between what we call emotional pain and actual mm. physical pain. And actually, um, uh, if you have broken up with your girlfriend, that certain painkillers use the same pathway um, uh, and, and uh, treat the same sort of areas that if you, you know, if you get dumped by someone, taking an aspirin might actually uh, make you feel better. But and, and, and this is, I, I was blown away with actually good solid research to show that there is some sort of overlap here. So emotional pain does seem to be as valid as physical pain. Um, the final question I want to ask you, was this a difficult, um, was it difficult to, to interview these children or, or like, did, did you leave anyone going, oh my God, that poor child at such a young age uh, must be so difficult for them? Mm. It was certainly difficult, yes. I mean, we did it in such a way that we would go into a school in the morning and we'd go from junior infants to sixth class and all the children in the school would fill in our questionnaire. So it would ask about their quality of life generally, whether they had pain or not. And once they had filled in that questionnaire, they were asked, do you have a pain right now? or have you had a pain for the last three months? And we went through all that anchoring. Um, but we did it so that the children who had pain would continue, they'd fill out their questionnaire about pain specifically, but the other children would be drawing a picture to enter into a competition. So in that way, we didn't single out any children. They all finished at the same time. Hang on a second, the children who had pain couldn't win the competition? <laughs> they could cruel, they cruel enter woman. in the competition. <laughs> Hannah Durand, everyone. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is Maria Gallo. She's development manager in the office of the president at St. Angela's College in Sligo. Um, she is uh, looking at how the relationships between alumni and higher education institutions can yield lifelong benefits for, for both the individual and the institution over a lifetime. So um, administration and staff at NUI Galway and St. Angela's, listen up. Uh, please give her a round of applause. Maria Gallo. Graduation day, donning the cap and gown, the elation of this momentous occasion, and then the president steps up to the podium and says, keep in touch. Well, this sentiment is probably the furthest thing from your mind. You're probably just imagining yourself gra grabbing your parchment in hand and imagining yourself escaping from campus with this bright new future ahead. Keep in touch. This is the crux of my research looking at the, the, the relationship and the potential and the value of these relationships between graduates, alumni, and their alma mater, the university. I've used mixed methods approaches to develop a number of new and now internationally recognized paradigms that look at an alumni relationship building cycle that is based on four key themes. And today I'm going to just go through one of the paradigms with you that, that looks at the development of uh, the alumni's relationship and interactivities with their alma mater. So the first stage is a proactive stage. So you haven't graduated yet, you're still a student, and you're motivated proactively to meet the qualifications to graduate. And you're also getting involved in many activities. You might get involved in the canoe club or get involved in certain societies. And this, this builds your affiliations with the university, both academic and um, outside extracurricular. Then you graduate, and that's your second stage. And this is when you've escaped into the world, and it's the university themselves that spend their time trying to, uh, to, uh, to interact with you through a, a various advancement communications, such as an alumni magazine or an e-newsletter. And the alumni themselves are really inactive, or um, they're reactive at this time. And it's the university that's trying to build their affinity. Then it's the, the, the next stage is, the, uh, is the, the engagement stage. And this is where people are become active again as alumni. And you, it's for your own social, social, personal, or professional development. So this might be to, um, to attend a reunion or get involved in networking activities. And finally, it, there is the interactive stage. And this is where alumni are um, looking to give uh, back to the university themselves for the university's benefit. So it might give their time, such as maybe getting involved in recruitment, their talent, becoming, say, a student mentor, or their treasure, giving donations back to the university. The next stage of my research is looking at alumni narratives. 
and I wish to bring this, this research to life through a number of stories. So I invite you to keep in touch with my research, to consider how you keep in touch with your alma mater and, uh, and the importance of this kind of interactivity between you and your alma mater. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. Um, now, you're, you're not American, you're Canadian. Yes, right. Um, this is a big thing in, Amer in America and in North, uh, North America and Canada as well. Uh, yeah. You know, if you're a Harvard man or a Yale right. lady, I'm going to talk about the gender thing in a bit, but uh, it's something that people really wear on their sleeve and it's something that often comes up almost in the first three sentences. Um, that's not the case here, except perhaps if you... No, it really isn't the case here, although there are some universities that people are, are, you know, do talk about a bit more. Why is that? Why, why in America? Why is your university the, you know, part of your... Your, 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 I suppose your, your personality. Well, I, I guess it's something, it's very historic, and obviously there's a lot of, um, of, of legacy. This is something that's come up, too, on advancement studies, institutional advancement studies, which I'm interested in. But you have to think of, um, Jonathan, all that investment that people have made even before they've graduated, or even before they've thought about going to university. And that's obviously really seeped into the IR system and internationally, too. So, you know, think of the the blood and the sweat and the tears around the leaving cert or things, or you know, choosing universities. And then people can't wait to get out the other side and just run away, when in fact there's a whole richness of, of having a, a lifelong connection with your university. And this is something that in, the, in North America they are trying to capitalize, the universities themselves. And what I'm trying to argue is that you know, if the universities are going to be doing this anyway and trying to woo you, why not get some benefit back yourselves and in, as individuals? Um, I, I kind of said uh, Yale, I'm a Yale man or a Harvard man, I, I'm a Yale lady doesn't seem to sort of say, I mean, is, is it mostly men who traditionally have this relationship with their alma mater, as they call it, in, in America? I mean, traditionally that would have been the case, and uh, there would have obviously been these legacies of families, and, you know, especially men. And, you know, even if you look in the Irish context, you know, the original would have been, you know, men that would have been educated and also educated in... I suppose you don't have to go that many generations right. behind before you, you don't have that many women going to university that, anyway. Precisely, yeah. and also that it had, it had a, a link to religion too, of course, and there was also that link there too. So, um, but now we have the opportunity to be opening it up. And so that means that people, and you know, women in particular, can have these connections with people. So you might have a Nobel Prize winner or somebody who's a particularly amazing who graduated from the same alma mater as you. I mean, Jonathan, there are people that may be connected to you because of the, you might be the same alma mater as them, and they now have a connection to you. Yeah. No, I know. I, I, I mean, for example, my, my, I'm, I'm speaking next uh, week at my old school. So like that sort of relationship does, does actually happen. Yeah. And, uh, is it more likely, if the school is higher ranking or has more esteem, that people are more likely to have this sort of relationship? I mean, think people from Trinity College and University College Cork uh, very quickly self-identify uh, as that. I, I think traditionally, I, it, I don't have a huge experience of it from anywhere Galway. Maybe, maybe people do, but certainly when it comes to UCC or Trinity, I, I didn't go to either, by the way. Um, that there is this sort of sense of, you know, I'm, a, you know, I went to Trinity. There's that sort of sense of. Uh, of community. And there, that sense of community, I think, is starting to grow a lot, um, across a, a lot of the universities across Europe. And this is what I was talking to you before. And so we're, you know, we have that opportunity here to create a lifelong community here at NUI Galway and you know, across all the different um, you know, higher education institutions. And this will benefit you know, across society, just for the individual, but also in like, local communities. So people have the opportunity to use those um, you know, universities are mini cities, so you know we have the opportunity to, to kind of connect with these things that are on campus. You know, for over our lifetime. Okay, Maria Gallo, everyone. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Liam Lax, uh, who uh, during the summer uh, began a project assessing the dis distribution of vulnerable deep sea coral ecosystems off the west coast uh, of Ireland here, um, uh, in including getting to use the RV uh, Celtic Explorer, which is pretty cool. Uh, he is going to be talking about how to predict uh, where coral goes. Please give uh, poor Liam, who's, uh, who will struggle up on stage, uh, a round of applause. Liam Lax. How are you doing? Um, colourful coral reefs in cold, wet Ireland. It's not something that rolls off the tongue very easily, and it's not something you might expect in the, the karst landscapes of Ireland. 
Usually when we think of corals, we think of the tropics, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and Indonesia, all of these sort of places. But just off the west coast of Ireland, we also have coral reefs. Um, they're significantly different from the tropical corals. For one thing, they don't need light to create their own energy to survive. This means that they can be found between 500 and 1,000 meters depth just off the west coast of Ireland, as you can see there. Between 2 degrees and 10 degrees, where uh, a surface coral in the tropics can't survive below 16 degrees Celsius. So they're significantly different. But how do they actually survive and create their own energy on the seabed? Well, if you look on the top left-hand picture, you can see lots of little particles are flowing past this coral. That's called marine snow. And it's the decaying uh, matter that comes from fish, jellyfish, zooplankton. It sinks from the surface oceans, and it settles on the seabed. And that is the spuds and cabbage of coral reefs. They love to eat this stuff. But as for me, if there was spuds and cabbage on the floor, I wouldn't go near it. Well, a coral can't eat particles that are on the seafloor. It has to be suspended above the, the seabed to flow past. The theory is that deep internal tidally forced waves crash into the continental slope. Uh, turbulent mixing occurs and resuspends these particles. Now, this summer, I've been, I've been uh, tracing the beams that these waves actually take. And I've been trying to look at where these waves actually crash into the continental slope. And what I've found is that the waves themselves crash into the continental slope between 600 and 1,000 meters depth. Now, if you remember the distribution of corals, they, they're found between 500 and 1,000 meters. As you can see here, these are wave beams. And if you look at the light blue and the pink beams, they're crashing into the continental slope at the same depth as you actually find the corals themselves. So this is a, a good result. The problem with um, modeling the distributions of cold water coral ecosystems, it's very expensive. You need to use echo sounding machinery on big ships to create high, um, high resolution bathymetry maps. And then you can make a good model to model the distribution. What I'm proposing is that we use this type of hydrographic modeling of internal waves, along with the cheap bathymetry maps that you get from satellites. Coupling these two things together, it could be a financially viable solution to modeling cold water coral ecosystems with the aims of a global conservation effort for these vulnerable and important habitats. Thanks. Uh, Liam, I think most people are familiar with the Great Barrier Reefs and uh, Great Barrier Reef and uh, its beautiful and colourful uh, flora, flora and fauna. Uh, why do we need to protect cold water coral deep in the seabed? Well, a lot of fish, up to 70% of the fish that we actually eat uh, every day, some of the, the juvenile stages of these fish, you can find the juveniles in cold water coral ecosystems. So, like a surface coral reef is a, it's a nursery for fish. It's a very important place for the, the biomass and biodiversity to actually uh, to thrive. If we, say, eliminated all of the cold water coral reef ecosystems, we don't know exactly what would happen, but we could fairly expect that fisheries would start decreasing. So for commercially, uh, commercially available fish, it's an important habitat. And for this reason, it's important to to model the distribution of them with the, with the aim of conserving them. Um, there, there's obviously damage that happens to Great Barrier Reef. I presume there's damage that happens to corals here in Ireland. Uh, have you seen this uh, yourself? And, and is this why it's so important to protect the coral because it's being damaged? Yes, absolutely. Um, actually, one of the main things that... So we went out this summer on the Celtic Explorer. Mm. It's a marine institute vessel. And uh, you take this robot down to the seabed and you get this live imaging stream that comes back to the ship, and you're seeing everything that on the seabed, and you're, you're moving around these, these beautiful coral reefs, as you saw in the first pictures, and suddenly you get to an area that's completely flattened. The, the coral's 3D structures are just destroyed, it's just rubble. And you also find along with this all lots of ropes, trawling gear. So it's clear that deep sea trawling does sometimes uh, have, have very bad effects for, for these coral ecosystems. 
So if you can conserve a habitat, there's actually a, a special area of conservation just west of Ireland um, on the Porcupine Bank. This is an area where you can't do deep sea trawling. Um, so in Ireland, we're fairly good for this, but globally, there's a lot of countries that haven't got this on their priority list. So if you can, if you can have um, cheap, cheap ways of modeling the distribution, then hopefully we can, we can have a, a conserved coral ecosystem throughout the world. Liam Lax, everyone. Thanks. OK, uh, we're down to our final speaker. Uh, Paul Mannion is a postgraduate research student studying sports, aerodynamics in NUI Galway. He is a member of the GEEK team. Uh, that stands for Galway Energy and Efficient Car. I'm not slurring him. Uh, and uh, he has designed an aerodynamic car uh, to improve on GEEK 1.0. Please put your hands together for Paul Mannion. So, hi. My first question is, has anybody here actually heard of the GEEK? So what the GEEK is, is the Galway Energy Efficient Car. Uh, we designed and built it last year, and we actually took it to Rotterdam, where we actually we raced it. And we actually surprised even ourselves by achieving a fuel efficiency score of 8,000 miles per gallon. So I was left with the difficult task then of how do we improve upon this score for next year. So primarily what my research is, is how do we improve the car through the use of aerodynamics. So by improving the aerodynamics of the car, we can actually improve the fuel efficiency of the car. So here is an image of Geek 1.0. So it's a relatively simple design for a car. So it's got three wheels, two wheels are outside. Uh, the back wheel then, which is a singular wheel, is inside the car. So, and the competition that we actually entered was the Shell Eco Marathon. Um, so, I developed several concepts initially then around, around the first car initially on how, how can we improve the aerodynamics. So, let's say we put the wheels inside the car. That's a very easy way of, let's say, improving the aerodynamics. So, some of the original concept designs that we have here, the very first one, my supervisor, he actually compared that to a whale. So, I took that as a compliment because whales are very aerodynamic under the water. While the third concept here, one of my best mates, he told me it looked like a spaceship and it was cool, but it was actually the worst aerodynamic design that I came up with. So how I actually analyzed aerodynamics, I used what's called computational fluid dynamics. So essentially, we can model the fluids flowing around the car, which is air in this case, on a computer. So we can tell exactly what its aerodynamics characteristics are. So we have an example here of concept two, and we can kind of see vortices trailing from the car, which essentially are bad, very bad for aerodynamics. So we want to eliminate things like that with future designs. So what I was able to do then with each design, I was able to look at what's the good aerodynamic or characteristic and what's the bad aerodynamic characteristic. And how, would I, how can I eliminate the bad characteristic then to create a brand new car effectively that is more aerodynamic and more fuel efficient. So the finalized design shown here, which was a hybrid of previous designs taking the good characteristics, characteristics and taking the bad, well, eliminating the bad characteristics. Um, and we can see from this simulation here, we can see the flow, the airflow actually coming over, over the car and there's no actual forces, there's no mad huge wake behind the car. So essentially, this is how we improve fuel efficiency. So the car doesn't have to expend energy pushing through the air, it essentially just slips through the air um, nice and handily. So the car is actually entering its construction phase at the moment. So it's going to have a carbon fiber shell with an aluminium chassis inside. And we're hoping to enter it in the 2016 Shell Eco Marathon in London. So best luck to us, I hope, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks very much. I'm, I'm totally fine to wish yourself luck. Um, <laughs> it's very cool. Uh, why are um, our car, my, car, my car doesn't look anything like that? Why is that? <laughs> um, essentially, there's government regulations that have to be overcome first. So firstly, for a car to be aerodynamic, it has to be, let's say, slightly longer and streamlined. But you have to have a rear view mirror, and then you have to have a window shaped in a certain way so you can actually see out, where these cars don't allow for that. But now with the introduction of cameras, like new legislations are being passed in countries where we can actually, we don't have to have a mirror, and we can have a camera telling, we can look at the screen in front of us and say, oh yeah, there's nothing behind us. So aerodynamic designs are actually being taken into account now with much, much newer cars, cars that aren't even on the market yet, but hopefully in the next five to ten years they will and So our cars may start looking like your Geek 2.0? Hopefully, we'll find <laughs> out. Right. Um, 8,000 miles per gallon. 
we're actually hoping to double that now next year. Maybe, what? Maybe get 16,000. So. so, but like someone has to be in the car. Someone has to be a driver, yes. Uh, not me, I'm too big. So. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it because, it's, frankly, tonight has been very uh, judgmental. Um, uh, but so, so, you, uh, so, like a jockey or something, is that the idea? So <laughs> yeah, essentially for the race that we put it in, we look like a tiny baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, it's supposed to be very exciting, though, to, to kind of run this model. Can you take us through, um, is it all, compu can, can a computer uh, accurately predict uh, uh, fluid dynamics in that way that you can just go make a little bit more roundy and then and and and, and you can predict exactly how wind will it, will will affect. It. Do we have that technology? Essentially, yes, yeah. And that technology's been out there for years and years now. The expensive part of the technology is you need a supercomputer to run it. So it's getting to the stage now where actual desktops that we can buy are reaching supercomputer stages of let's say 20 years ago. So we can actually run such simulations on a computer. It might take two days, three days to run, but from that we can see exactly where we need to design it, what we need to change, what's actually happening with the car. With Is there a coffee cup holder in that? The, I mean, if you're doing 8,000 miles, like, <laughs> you, you want to at least offer drink. It's, you know, driver fatigue and everything. Uh, Paul Manning, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Tricky, tricky, tricky decision for our judges. Um, I think you'll agree we had some great speakers and some really fascinating topics. Um, you also have the power to judge, as you have been doing already this evening. Uh, you'll have a little program, and in the program you can uh, tick the box for your favourite. Um, I'm not sure if you ordered, but I'm sure the instructions are fairly straightforward. Uh, if you can hand them to Kira, this is one, you just pick one. I can just see a finger pointing up. Either that or someone's really having a great time. Uh, so just one, pick your favourite speaker for the evening. I know it's very difficult, uh, but when you've done that, if you can hand your leaflets, uh, and we will see you in 30 minutes where we'll hear from last year's winner, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll find out who this year's thesis uh, winner is. Uh, thanks very much for being such a great audience so far. See you in a few bits. <laughs>